not a, 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 an argument about the justness of any particular intervention, but rather a, 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 the paper defends a more general claim about the kinds of things we ought to care about when we're thinking about the justness of a potential intervention. So political commentators and the general public frequently express scepticism um, concerning the explanations that are given by states for engaging in humanitarian interventions, and they often attribute to these interveners rather more self-interested reasons for intervening um, than those offered by the interveners themselves. And underlying this scepticism and reflected in the philosophical literature is a concern that an otherwise permissible instance of humanitarian intervention might be rendered impermissible if it turns out that, in fact, the intervening state's motivations were not genuinely humanitarian. So in this paper, I argue for what I call a justification-based account of intervention, according to which the permissibility of humanitarian intervention is determined by two central criteria. The first is that there exists a sound justification for intervention, roughly that there is a threatened or an ongoing process of widespread serious rights violations that can be best averted by military force and such force is proportionate. This criterion can be satisfied ad bellum, that is, before the war takes place. The second criterion is that the actions of the interveners are reasonably expected to aid. And this criterion applies largely to the in bello behaviour of the state, that is, the behaviour um, of the combatants during the war, um, although it does also, I think, give us a way to assess the ad bellum aspects of a proposed intervention as well. I defend the priority of these criteria against the suggestion that the intentions of interveners are central to the permissibility of intervention. I suggest that the intentions-based view wrongly prioritises the moral character of the intervener over the interest of the potential beneficiaries of intervention. And this isn't to deny that, uh, that intentions can ever be relevant to moral permissibility, but it's to make the much more limited claim that in situations in which one can act to avert great suffering, imperfect intentions do not render so acting impermissible. Now, whilst accounts of the permissibility of humanitarian intervention are often pluralist in that they allow that um, various factors might affect the legitimacy of an intervention, most accounts identify one central factor as really being the primary criterion of permissibility. So drawing upon the work of Augustine, Alex Bellamy has argued that right intention is the pivotal factor in determining the legitimacy of an intervention. He says that we must judge whether the intervener intended to prevent or halt an injustice and promote peace. Victor Tadros has also argued that it's the intentions that matter. Tadros holds that the mere existence of reasons that could justify intervention can't in fact justify intervention if those reasons play no, no role in an intervener's deliberations. And he says that the fact that the war could have been justified on preventive humanitarian grounds, if indeed it could, is insufficient to render an intervention permissible. The fact that these ends would be secured could render the, the war justifiable, he says. Um, it has the potential to be justified. But if the acts of the invaders were in fact justified, but he says that the acts of the invaders are in fact actually justified only if they act for the right reason. So it matters what motivates the intervention. If their acts of war were not justified because they act for the wrong reason, then these acts are wrongful. So in section two of the paper, I argue that Bellamy's intentions-based account is not going to be the practical account of how we should judge humanitarian intervention that he would like it to be. And in section three, I argue more generally that intentions are just the wrong place to look when we're thinking about the permissibility of humanitarian intervention. Now, Bellamy is explicitly seeking a useful account of intervention, that is, one that can be used by lawmakers and others to judge permissibility of particular interventions. He describes his aim as that of shedding important light on both the way that international society evaluates legitimacy claims about intervention and the framework that world society should use to morally interrogate the actions of states. So there's an explicit sort of uh, practical aim here that's part of this theory. Now, although we can never be entirely sure that we've correctly judged intentions, Bellamy argues that we can reliably assess them 
by A, examining the state's given reasons for intervening and comparing them with other possible explanations, and B, examining the way in which the state plans and executes its intervention. Now, I think we should be sceptical of both of the, um, these proposed methods for assessing intention and that partly as a result of this scepticism, the plausibility of using intentions to assess the permissibility of humanitarian intervention. So let's start with the, with the ad bellum intentions. So if we think about state intentions, well, there's a general problem that's going to arise once we raise this notion of state intentions that Bellamy doesn't really address. Namely, that of course a state is an abstract entity that has no intentions at all. So it is presumably the intentions of the leaders um, that are under scrutiny here. But there's no guarantee that the intentions of this group of people will converge. So we could imagine, for example, the British cabinet thinking about whether or not they ought to intervene in Kosovo. Now, the prime minister might just sort of generally dislike Serbs and be glad of the opportunity to do some Serb bombing. The defence minister might think that this is a good opportunity to have some training for the British army and think that this is you know, good practice for a real war. It might also be a good opportunity to test some new equipment or technology. Now, the foreign minister might just intend to bring humanitarian aid. Now, all of these people can favour the intervention, and they all do favour the intervention, but their intentions here differ significantly. So whose intentions matter? Now, assuming that the prime minister cannot act without the support of her cabinet, all the intentions play a role in bringing the intervention about. It's not clear, then, how we can sensibly speak of the single intention behind the intervention. So I'm not wholly sceptical of the role of intentions in determining permissibility when it comes to individual actions, but it's at least considerably harder to rely on them when assessing the permissibility of an action or a series of actions that's initiated, initiated and steered by a group of people. And this is not merely because of the difficulty of establishing what intentions are, which is going to, this difficulty will increase as you increase the number of relevant people. It's also because when we have multiple intentions, there's no clear way of ranking or reconciling these intentions such that we can identify a single intention by which we then judge an action's permissibility. I think that moreover, if we take a closer look at Bellamy's suggestions for establishing intention, this shows it's not always as easy to establish intention as he believes. So his first suggestion is that we might analyse a state's reasons for acting, um, where this is achieved by, in part by comparing the justifications that it gives with other possible explanations of its actions. Now, it's not made clear how Bellamy's conceiving of the relationship between intentions and justifications, but they seem to me likely to be different things, likely to elicit different commentaries. So, for example, a state may say that it intends to mount an aerial bombing campaign in particular areas of the target state in order to disable certain parts of that state's infrastructure followed by a ground offensive in which it aims to capture or kill certain groups or persons. Now, it may say that its intention in doing so is to eliminate a threat to a group of civilians and to restore stability in the state. Now, this is a description of the state's intentions in terms of both what it intends to do and what it intends to achieve by doing those things. But it is purely descriptive. The justification of those actions, in contrast, will surely tell a different normative story Saying that one plans to eliminate a threat and restore stability is not enough to turn a description into a justification. The justification will have to use, include various other claims, such as that the threat in question constitutes a serious violation of important rights, that the proposed force is a proportionate means of halting that violation, that it is the most effective way to achieve it, and that alternative non-military methods are not available. And none of these claims, which are really the meat of any justification for military action, depend for their truth upon the intentions of the intervening state. It may be the case that the intervening state is merely seeking to assert its military power in the region, deterring potential aggressors to itself. But this does not affect whether the proposed intervention is a proportionate means of halting rights violations nor will it affect whether the threat posed to the potential beneficiaries is grave, whether the action is a last resort, and so on. An analysis of the, of the offered justification, therefore, need not shed any light on intentions. What it will do, rather, is put forward reasons for intervening 
the weight of which can be assessed independently of whether they are the reasons upon which the state's leaders are acting, and the soundness of which does not depend upon the leader's intentions. Now, the second component of Bellamy's suggestion is, is a comparative component. So he suggests that we could take the, the justification for intervention that's offered by a state and then compare it with other possible explanations that the state might have um, for intervening. And the idea is that if there exists some alternative possible explanation that would also explain why this state is willing to intervene, and this explanation has a goal of national interest rather than humanitarian beneficence, then it's reasonable to assume that it's the self-interested goal that the interveners intend to bring about. So he says that the comparison can tell us whether the state is merely offering a pretext for action. If so, Bellamy thinks that the intervention is inspired by egoism rather than right intent and cannot, from this perspective, be justified. But this kind of comparative evaluation, which for Bellamy speaks not just to our assessment of the blameworthiness of the actors, but also to the permissibility of their actions, is undesirable, I think, in at least two ways. So if we cite intentions as crucial to the permissibility of purported humanitarian interventions, we surely want to base our judgments on the presence or absence of humanitarian intentions. But Bellamy's comparative evaluation makes the likelihood of finding in a state's favour contingent on factors other than whether or not the, fact does in fa the state does in fact have humanitarian intentions. So we can imagine a case in which um, there's a proposed, a proposed intervention that's to take place in a country whose stability is regionally important or that happens to be oil rich or where the dominant religion is hostile to the intervening state's dominant religion. Or perhaps the intervening state is due for an election or has some new weapons it would like to test or could use a war to assert its dominance in the region. Any of these facts would provide an alternative, prudentially based explanation of the intervention. Indeed, in almost any situation in which an intervention seems necessary, there are likely to be possible alternative explanations of using force that are self-serving rather than humanitarian. The mere existence of these alternatives undermines, on Bellamy's account, the plausibility of the intervening states acting for humanitarian reasons, irrespective of whether or not they are in fact the reasons for which the state acts. Now, in addition, some of these features, such as being oil rich, are pretty inescapable properties of some states. And thus, these self-interested explanations will always be possible and perhaps always plausible when considering intervention in those states. On Bellamy's account, this seems to preclude its being permissible to intervene in such a state, no matter how dire the humanitarian situation. But we should not prohibit interventions that could rescue people from harm, simply because a state is prepared, that is prepared to intervene has various possible grounds for doing so, and its intentions may or may not be humanitarian. And we should not make it harder to mount a case for intervening in some states compared with others in virtue of that state's having certain natural properties like happening to have oil. What we need to know if we favour the intention-based view is not whether the state has sufficient alternative reasons for acting, but whether it is acting for humanitarian reasons. But how would one go about analysing or judging which reasons are really operative at the ad bellum level? I contend that one cannot establish, simply by way of comparison, that an offered justification does not reflect the leader's intentions. It seems to me that all one can do to judge the permissibility of the intervention at the ad bellum level, that is, before the war, is to assess the soundness of the offered justification independently of whether you think it's what really motivates the state that says it will intervene. If those reasons would in fact justify intervention, it doesn't matter whether they reflect the leader's in intentions. I think the question of in bello intentions is more useful. So Bellamy thinks that we can also establish intentions in part by looking at what a state actually does during the course of an alleged humanitarian intervention. A state that claims to intend to rescue people from serious harm, only to then bomb the area where, for example, the alleged beneficiaries of this rescue mission have taken refuge, is clearly going to undermine its claims to be engaged in some kind of humanitarian mission. Now, if Bellamy's right that intentions determine permissibility, then looking at how a state goes about intervening can be helpful in telling us whether the intervention is permissible. So what is it about a state's actions, or the actions of its combatants specifically, that we should consider when trying to establish the state's intentions? 
Bellamy suggests that we adopt Michael Waltz's idea of double intent, which requires that combatants actively minimize even merely foreseen harms to non-combatants. So when combatants take measures to ensure as far as possible that they do not harm non-combatants, even when doing so exposes the combatants themselves to greater risk of harm, we can infer, Bellamy says, that their intentions are really humanitarian. Thus, he says that the strategies employed by NATO in Kosovo, for example, reveal a lack of humanitarian intent, since the selection of air power alone rendered it almost impossible for NATO to halt the campaign of murder and ethnic cleansing. Now, one difficulty with Waltz's idea of double intent concerns the appropriate dist distribution of risk between combatants and non-combatants, especially in a war of humanitarian intervention. The philosopher Jeff McMahon has argued that it can be permissible for a rescuer to shift the costs of rescue onto the beneficiary. So imagine that you're drowning in a river and I can pull you out and I can save your life, but in order to do so I have to either break your wrist or break my own wrist. Now McMahon argues that since it's you who's going to benefit from this, this, this rescue mission, it's permissible for me to make you bear those costs so I can break your wrist rather than breaking my own. And this seems to me to be correct. In addition, and, and, and particularly germane to our purposes here, it would be very odd to claim that if I distribute the costs of rescuing you in this way, if I make you bear the cost of being rescued, then my mission no longer counts as a humanitarian one, that I no longer count as having the end or the intention of rescuing you. Now, if that's right, if I can count as, as having a genuinely humanitarian and even if I make you bear the costs of the rescue, then it looks like in wars of humanitarian intervention, even if combatants are shifting the cost of the rescue onto the potential beneficiaries, it doesn't follow that we can decide that this is not a humanitarian mission, mission after all. Now, as Bellamy indicates, Kosovo is probably the paradigmatic rejection of Waltz's double intent standard. So NATO leaders um, famously opted for a form of intervention that minimised all risks to its own troops, um, exposing non-combatants to serious risks of harm. But I don't think this does show a lack of humanitarian intent. And so I think Bellamy's actually wrong to think that even his own account would show the Kosovo in intervention to be impermissible on his own account. If the NATO intervention was impermissible, this impermissibility must instead arise from the fact that the means adopted were unlikely to promote humanitarian ends. And this supports the view that I want to defend, that it's what the state does, rather than what it intends, that grounds permissibility. So more generally, the whole direction of intentions-based accounts seems to me to be mistaken. Either people are in need of rescue from an actual or an impending catastrophe, or they are not. Whether they are or not is neither determined nor illuminated by examining the intentions of those who are well placed to rescue them. If we care about their intentions, it should be only because of what they tell us about what the interveners are likely to do during the, interve during the intervention, the kinds of strategies that they're likely to adopt and so on. In Bellamy's account, for example, the importance of rescuing the victims just gets completely overshadowed, I think, by this emphasis on the moral character of the intervener, as if that somehow that's what we should really care about. Now, if we think about the circumstances in which we might use force in another country, we presumably begin by pointing to some kind of crisis that we think warrants intervention. But once this triggering condition is satisfied, the intentions-based view then really shifts its whole attention to facts about the intervening states. So if we take, for example, the Rwandan genocide of 1994, imagine that we have imaginary state A. Philosophers always use imaginary states. Huh? So we have state A, and it's moved purely by the plight of the Tutsis, and it's willing to intervene to protect them. But state A is poor, with a fairly badly equipped army. Its intervention will halt the genocide, but their more crude weaponry will cause much more collateral harm, and it will take longer to secure the safety of the Tutsis, during which time some Tutsis will be killed. Now, state B, in contrast, is rich and has a technologically advanced military that could quickly halt the genocide with less collateral harm, saving many more Tutsi lives. But state B's intention in intervening would be to give its troops some combat experience and diminish the power of the Hutus in Rwanda, whom they've never liked much anyway. An account that focuses on what motivates the intervention or what the interveners intend seems committed to the view that not only would it be better for the poorer state A to intervene, but that only state A is permitted to intervene. 
And it seems to me very hard to reconcile that result with a concern for the welfare of the Tutsis. So I think that rather than focusing on intentions to determine the permissibility of humanitarian intervention, we should look at justifications and actions. So by justifications, I mean that we should consider whether there are sufficient reasons to intervene in a, gi in a given state. So roughly this is going to mean that there are widespread and serious rights violations occurring in the state or a credible threat of such violations and that the state's leaders are either unwilling or unable to prevent these violations or are instrumental in their perpetration. Now I'll take it as uncontro uncontroversial that these are the kinds of facts that justify intervention in what we can loosely call an objective sense. And there certainly seem to be the, the kind of facts that would normally trigger a conversation um, about whether a particular state ought to intervene in another country. If military force is likely to be the only or perhaps the most effective means of curtailing the violations and is a proportionate response to those violations, I suggest that, suggest that this provides sufficient reason to intervene in the state. So to use Tadros's terms, the intervention is justifiable. Now the second feature of a uh, justifications-based account concerns what the state does in a pretty basic sense really, what kinds of weapons it uses, what kind of strategies it employs, where and how it engages the enemy and so on. And in this sense I think that Bellamy is right that we need to pay attention to the methods employed by state's armed forces as they engage in interventions. But Bellamy thinks that we should study actions because they can reveal intentions and then it's the intentions that really ground the permissibility. But I think we should study a state's actions because they are themselves the ground of permissibility. As long as actions are reasonably expected to aid, the agent's intentions need not be humanitarian in order for their action to be permissible. And note that I'm distinguishing actions from outcomes here. So when I talk of what a state does, I mean to indicate the courses of actions in which it engages considered in light of the likely or predicted outcomes. Um, I'm not advocating here some sort of consequentialist account where permissibility turns on whether in fact the actions do turn out to prevent harm. So I suggest that when it comes to averting very serious harms, neither intentions nor motives determine the permissibility of an agent's actions. So imagine that I come over to your house to watch television one evening. And we watch my favourite show, which is of course Crime Watch which makes an appeal for information regarding the whereabouts of a very dangerous criminal who has murdered two people and is likely on the lookout for more victims. Now, as luck would have it, or well, probably bad luck if you think about it, only hours earlier, I rented an apartment to this man. So I'm pretty sure I know exactly where he is. And even more luckily, Crime Watch are offering a £10,000 reward for information leading to his arrest. Now, I couldn't care less about this guy murdering people, as long as he pays his rent on time but I am pretty tempted by the £10,000 reward. So I decide to call the hotline and I tell them where he is in order to get the money. Now, clearly, I'm blameworthy for my indifference towards this man's victims and towards the very real possibility that he's going to kill other people. It would speak much better of my character if I phoned the hotline out of a genuine concern that this villain be brought to justice before he can harm anyone else. But my mercenary intentions do not render my phoning the hotline impermissible. That much seems clear. On the contrary, morality requires me to call the hotline. Now, morality might also require me to call for the right reasons. But I don't think my failure to fulfil this second duty um, undermines the first duty to call the hotline. And this seems to me generally plausible when we think about opportunities to avert serious harm. So I might rescue a drowning child because I intend to use my heroism in my campaign to be appointed to the local government, for example, rather than because I intend to save the child's life and spare her parents the grief of her death. Now, this speaks very badly of my character, but it's still much better and morally permissible that I rescue the child rather than fail to do so. Now, I think there could be some cases in which my intention makes a difference between my acting permissibly and my acting impermissibly, of course. So perhaps I throw you a surprise party because I want to give you a heart attack. Um, now, that could render throwing the party wrong, right? Um, even if, as it turns out, you, know, you stubbornly fail to comply with my wishes and you just have a really nice time. So as I said, this isn't a kind of consequentialist view where permissibility turns on what actually happens. I think sometimes um, my intentions can render my acting in a particular way wrongful. But I think when it comes to actions that I undertake knowing or believing that they'll avert very serious harm, it doesn't matter for the purposes of permissibility what my intentions are, provided that my actions can be reasonably expected to avert that harm. 
And I think similarly, whilst the intentions of a state's leaders are relevant to our judgments of their character, we shouldn't take those to determine the permissibility of rescuing people from serious harm. Now, of course, there's some sense in, we, in which we have to look at what a state intends to do in order to form a judgment about whether the intervention is justified. So we can't know, for example, whether war will be a proportionate response to a wrong unless we know what kind of tactics the state is going to employ during the course of the war. Nor can we satisfy the requirement of a reasonable prospect of success, which means success by legitimate means, unless we know which means are going to be employed. So there must be some description of the sort that I described above concerning a state's intentions, that, for example, it plans to launch an air assault, followed by a ground campaign, campaign and so on. But this is familiar from our usual reasoning about just ad bellum with respect to defensive wars. Here, too, we have to have some idea of the proposed methods of warfare in order to judge proportionality and so on. But as far as I'm aware, nobody takes that to mean that intention is the central factor in determining the permissibility of a defensive war. As I suggested above, I don't think we should care about the proposed strategy because it real reveals the state's intentions. The strategy itself is, of, is what's of real concern here, whether these methods are likely to promote humanitarian goals. And this can be assessed independently of whether the state is acting with humanitarian intent. How am I doing for time? Okay. Okay. All right. Can we be more specific? Or? <laughs> <laughs> just, just okay. That's okay. No, no, I can go with it. That's okay. Mm -hmm. So, we'll give you another five minutes. Okay, great. All right. So, so the final part of the paper um, deals with this, the, the issue of consent. And, and this is because it seems natural to think that it should be part of a, a justification in intervention for intervention that the intervention is consented to or welcomed by the intended beneficiaries. And those who advocate the inclusion of this sort of criterion will probably do so because of thoughts about self-determination. And such thoughts might include that it's important that states in period of revolution or transition are masters of their own fate in some way, um, or perhaps for reasons of national self-respect or because um, this increases the chances of long-term stability. Or we might think that if a population seems not to want outside interference, then it would be morally wrong to force it upon them. Or finally, we might think that foisting assistance upon people who don't want it is likely um, only to exacerbate a conflict. So we might wonder why I haven't included a criterion of, of um, consent in my account. But this is because I think there are both practical and moral problems with including a consent-based criterion in our account of justification for intervention. The practical problems arise because it will be very hard to know what percentage of a population supports foreign intervention in their country. We have no way of polling the intended beneficiaries to see whether there is general support for intervention. Now, we might look to social media or to news reports or talk to refugees to try to get a sense of whether intervention would be welcomed. But it will be hard to know whether the views that are expressed through those avenues are representative. And I think that this kind of unsystematic and informal surveying is likely to satisfy any reasonable standard of consent. Including actual consent as a criterion of permissibility would also make it always all almost always impermissible to intervene in very repressive states where we have the least access, even though these might be just the sorts of states in which intervention is most warranted. Now, because of these difficulties, there's a temptation to say, well, look, we can just assume that the intended beneficiaries of a rescue um, consent to being rescued. And after all, it's, it, it's hard to imagine that people would not want to be rescued from very serious harm, even if the rescue were to be enacted by some sort of historical foe or dented one's national self-respect. But even if we could secure reliable information that intervention would be welcomed, or even if we could reasonably assume this to be the case, this doesn't show that consent is a necessary part of our justification for intervening. I think we can see most clearly these difficulties by, with including consent by thinking about how the moral status of the intervention would be affected by a clear lack of consent. So imagine a state in which a humanitarian crisis is occurring and yet all of the signs indicate that more than 50% of the adult population oppose foreign intervention. Would the fact that a majority of people do not want to be rescued, or a majority of adults do not want to be rescued, undercut the rights of those who do want to be rescued to receive assistance? Well, it's hard to see how this could be the case, since the right not to be the victim of serious unjust harm 
is so much more stringent than the right not to be made better off against one's will. And remember that this result reflects only the adult population's wishes. Any state is going to have a sizable population of children whom we have a duty to aid, even if their parents oppose the intervention. So even if the percentage of adults opposing the intervention were very high, an overwhelming majority, I'm not sure that this could trump the right of the children to be rescued. Now, of course, if adult opposition was so strong that it seriously hampered the intervention's prospect of success, this could speak against the intervention. But here it would not be the lack of consent that undermined the case for the moral case for intervention, but rather the diminished likelihood of success that arises from the adult's opposition. So given this, I think that whilst the perceived attitude of the beneficiaries of intervention could feed into and should feed into our considerations about the likelihood of success, and thus indirectly form part of our deliberations about the justification for intervention, we shouldn't, in fact, include consent as a separate component of justification for intervening. OK, so to conclude, accounts that focus on intentions are, I think, unlikely to be successful in achieving the practical role that some of, them envisage, some of the theorists envisage for them. And I think that the kind of justification-based account that I've proposed is more attractive in this respect because it's easier to establish both prior to the waging of war and whilst the war is being fought. Whether or not there is a looming or an actual humanitarian crisis is something that's open to public scrutiny in the way that just causes for war should ideally be. It's also possible, although I haven't given an account of it here, to make informed judgments about what kinds of actions are likely to promote humanitarian goals. My account also gives priority to the rescuing of people in dire need over the moral character of the interveners. Of course, it would be morally better if we intervened in troubled states out of a genuine desire to aid. But intervening for self-interested reasons, but in a way that nonetheless secures humanitarian goods, is better than not intervening at all and is not wrong. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, are there any questions? I think we can allow ourselves five or ten minutes for questions. Wait a minute, we'll give you a, a microphone. <coughs> David Chandler from Westminster. I was just thinking about the debate around Syria and the key arguments seem to be about unintended consequences. And I'm just wondering whether that complicates the idea of justification and it could even be successful on its own terms. But it seems now that people are always banging on that we live in an entangled, complex world and it would really be reductionist and linear if we were to do justifications in the way that, that it can be done in a sort of, that it's a discrete and separate act. And I'm just wondering where, how that might impact and whether that might blur the barrier between the justificatory and a consequentialist discussion. Thank you. Um, I don't know that it would blur the boundary bef between a justificatory and a consequentialist discussion because the consequences and the, um, the likely consequences or, or predicted consequences can form part of a justification. Um, now, when we're talking about unintended consequences, they could nonetheless be foreseen, right? So. Um, I think we can try to make informed judgments about things we don't intend um, to bring about, but nonetheless, we realise there's a risk that we might, for example, spark ethnic conflicts or whatever, or spark other conflicts that um, perhaps are simmering, simmering um, beneath the surface. Um, and I think it's, it's much more difficult to make these judgments when it comes to wars of intervention compared to defensive wars. I think because we have a knowledge of the nuances of our own political system and our society um, that enables to make predictions about the likely consequences of a defensive war that it's much harder for us to make about the complexities of societies that we don't know particularly well, right? I mean, until fairly recently, most of us didn't know that much about the political regime in Syria, I'm guessing. Now we kind of, we've learned a lot very quickly. Um, but I'm still, I would be very reluctant, certainly as a philosopher, I'm no expert on the facts in, in somewhere like Ukraine or Syria or wherever. Um, I'd be very reluctant to sort of um, think that I could make a prediction about what would be likely to happen in this case if we intervened, which is why 
I focus here on thinking, trying to draw attention in a theoretical sense to the kinds of things we should care about. And I think that unintended but, possibly, but, but possible consequences is certainly something we should care about. Um, and I think that a justification can be, be, have a broad scope and think, take into account all of these things. Um, what I'm suggesting here is that we don't need to care about the state's intentions. And yet a lot of the debate tends to focus on that. If you think about even, even not even, say like the, the war in Iraq, right? Blair gave some sense that this was in, in part a humanitarian mission, um, and yet a lot of the debate focused on whether it was really a war about oil. And that's exactly the kind of case where I'm saying, look, if it were true that it would secure humanitarian goods, right, let's suppose that that's true, it doesn't matter whether it's motivated by oil, right? What matters is whether it's likely to secure those humanitarian goods and whether it's proportionate and so on. We don't need to think too much about what individual leaders in their minds intend in, in intervening. Another question. Um, hello, Tina Blom, LSE. Um, my question, I'm, I'm German, so it's a country that's pretty good at non-intervention, Iraq, Libya, and making the case for it. Um, so the question is, is non-intervention um, permissible? And um, if the answer is, is, is it always permissible? And if the answer is no, it's not always permissible, what do you judge that on, whether it's permissible or not? So, for example, you can't yet judge it on the action because there is no action in a case of non-intervention. So what are the right justifications for non-intervention? Right justifications. So I think uh, non-intervention can be permissible. So, for example, we could have... Um, so I kind of glossed over this in the talk, but when I said that there could be sufficient reasons for intervention, I meant something like um, the situation in the, in the country in which we're thinking of intervening generate sufficient reason that we might think intervention is a good idea, right? There's a serious humanitarian crisis. But there could be what I call external reasons. So if we imag imagine, for example, that um, Germany is very poor and uh, doesn't have money to fund its own healthcare system, for example, and the cost of the intervention would be, um, would be great and that therefore it would be depriving its own citizens of access to basic care. We might say, look, in this case, intervention is warranted, right? It would, it would be good to prevent this crisis, but nonetheless, it perhaps might not be permissible um, for the German government to decide to intervene because it might owe um, its own citizens' priority um, to the resources. So I think um, intervention can be sometimes... Uh, it's not always required, even when there's a sufficient case. Um, I also think, of course, there's many situations in which we might intervene, and it's too costly to intervene in all of them. So in, to some extent, you have to discriminate between cases and decide how you're going to intervene. And I think it could be that... Um, assuming that there's justification for intervening in a range of states, perhaps you can choose on the basis of self-interested national reasons which ones to go for. If any of them is permissible, then perhaps you're allowed to let your national preferences, as it were, influence where you decide to intervene. Um, I didn't quite catch the, the, the last part of your question about what would justify a... Yeah, it was basically going back to that the reasons you gave for justification were target state related. You said you have, you have to have mm. a target state, but I think for non-justification, as you just said, they're very often country, the country itself related, so you... Yeah. Okay, yeah, all oh, right, yeah, so, so that's a kind of case, like the Germany case would be an example of how reasons about the intervening state could mean that intervention wasn't required, yeah. Okay, there's three more que oh god, <laughs> loads of questions. So the gentleman there, then the gentleman in the jumper, the lady in the white t-shirt, and the lady on the left here. We'll be here all evening. <laughs> I won't. <laughs> <coughs> I'll just be very quick. I mean, it strikes me that there's a problem in thinking about intervention as something which is plausible. I mean, the, the history of the last 25 years suggests that there have been occasions where there have been normative arguments for intervention, but these have often been swamp, swamped by structure, by politics, by interests, and one has masked or disguised um, the other. And to in a way, it's a bit Manichaean to talk about we and constructing the right of intervention on moral, political, um, or geopolitical grounds, or on the grounds of rescuing subjects who may or may not have given their consent. And doesn't the evidence of the last 25 years rather suggest that, you know, contrary to David's comment, everything is pretty messy, and it's quite hard to establish who we are and what we stand for and how we act and whether we even have the power to um, to act in, in these kinds of progressive ways according to that definition that the we would make looking at the world out there. If you look at the empirical fact from Rwanda to Syria, we can't intervene, we. We don't know 
what we stand for, and we don't know how to do it. And even if we could do it and want to do it and know what we stood for, we're not doing it. Thank you. Um, I mean, when I talk about we, I'm talking about those in a position to, to intervene. Now, I'm not quite sure I follow when you say we can't intervene because we don't know who we are. Um, yeah, that's a long conversation. Um, that seems a, a, a sort of slightly peculiar metaphysical claim. Um, but, um, I mean, sure, right, you can claim something like, look, I mean, all of, I mean in a sense, all of this is, is conditional. I'd say, if it's true that military force would be an effective way of securing these rights, um, then that, that counts towards justification for military force. Now, you might just deny that premise and say, look, military force is never going to be an effective way of securing these rights. That seems to me implausible, right? I don't, I don't think we're in a position to make some sort of a priori claim that it's just, uh, as a matter of fact, force can never effectively prevent rights violations and be a proportionate means of doing so. But you might say, well, look at history, it just tends not to be very successful. But, uh, fine, I mean, this is, a, this is an argument directed at cases where saying this is, this is what it would have to look like in order to be permissible. We'd have to be thinking that actually mil military force um, would be an effective means of, of preventing or curtailing these abuses. If you think that can't happen, then okay, fine, then you're just saying intervention's never going to be permissible. I'm interested in people who think it can be permissible, um, but focus on what seems to me the wrong things like intentions, instead of focusing on whether in fact we could prevent abuses. Um, thank you. I just want to pick up on uh, the last point you made in relation to uh, state, intention, uh, state intentions don't matter. I think they do matter because they shape and influence the success and failure of the uh, humanitarian goals or achieving the humanitarian goals. And they shape and influence the outcome of a humanitarian interven intervention. Because if the basis isn't right, or the intention isn't just how the outcome can be. So it's a condition of my account that the actions have to be likely to secure the, the good. So it's not, um, but I don't think that, that it's the intentions themselves that matter. So I say that it, um, the state's actions have to be reasonably expected to aid. Um, so if, it were, if we had a case in which, um, say, the intervening state is motivated by something like a desire for access to cheap oil, and that this means it carries out the intervention in a way which means it doesn't achieve humanitarian goals, that's impermissible on my account, right? My account says that you have to be um, engaging in the intervention using strategies which are likely to secure the goods um, that justify the intervention. Might not be what motivates you, right? You might have ulter ulterior agenda as well. You might have other things which you're trying to achieve at the same time. And I think there's interesting questions about whether you can pursue those goals as a side, alongside actually securing the humanitarian goods. Um, but as long as, on my account, you'd have to be engaging in the intervention in a way which was likely to secure the goods. So there isn't this concern that actually the faulty motivation will result in just a failure of the intervention. Um, I, I'm concerned hearing you ju justify, you know, a war, war um, of intervention, and I'm concerned hearing you say, you know, intervening militarily. I advocate absolutely um, abolishing war and abolishing militarism. Um, military, it's the use of force and violence to solve problems, and I just don't think it's acceptable anymore. I just, <coughs> the risk is not worth it. The risk, you know, of war and militarism is always death and destruction and rape and an injury, and I just don't think it's worth it anymore. And I think that there are non-violent methods that, are all, that, that must be pursued and are always preferable. And I'm wondering if you're aware of Erica Chenwith and Maria Steppen's um, work, where they looked at conflict from 1900 to 2006. They looked at all, at all conflict, and they came to the conclusion that no, uh, military external intervention was not successful. Non, it had, it, it must, nonviolent uh, intervention was two times likely to uh, result in protecting rights, to achieving democracy. And I, I just, I don't want to study war. I don't want to study war no more. I, I, it, it's peace and nonviolence. I mean, I think the problem is that. Um, Failing to act is not without risks as well, right? So, yeah, sure, there's a risk if you use a certainty. If you employ military force, then you're going to cause death and so on. 
Um, there's also often certainty that if you don't use military force, then there's going to be death, famine, rape. I mean, it, it's clear that failures to intervene result in harm. Um, now, you can certainly make the point, as I already said, that um, perhaps you want to say that military force just always makes things worse. Now, if that's true, that's fine, right? Because what I put forward here is a conditional argument that says if, you, if using military force would be a proportionate and effective means of halting these abuses, it could be permissible. Now, if you want to say, look, it never is, we're not in disagreement, right? That's just an empirical claim. Um, and if it turns out that it's just true that war never, ever does any good, never secures human rights, is never better than not waging war, we don't disagree, right? I'd agree with you, right? Don't wage war in that situation. Um, I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm for the abolition of war as well. I'd love it if we never had to have war. Somebody said in one of the panels earlier that just war theory is about trying to, um, is, is opposed to the abolition of war, and that's really a mistake. Um, just war theorists are not committed to the idea that war is a good thing. Just war theorists think that sometimes war can be necessary, but of course we prefer a world in which war was not necessary. Now you might say, look, it can never achieve the goal. It's an empirical claim, right? I mean, and this is a theoretical account that says, if that's false, that empirical claim, which I think it probably is, um, then here's some things we should think about when we're trying to use force. Thank you. Um, I just want to ask, um, how do you secure the goods if the goods does not fall in your intention, your real intention? I mean, talking about the responsibility to protect, I'm, um, I'm keen to think that intention is key to intervention. And if you think about how to do something, you have to think about how that something will display consequences as well. So if you think of, the, for example, the actual situation in Libya, with all the expertises that is going on between the realists, um, <laughs> <laughs> pool of people that are leading you know, the actual world, how can you not consider uh, the consequences of your actions? So, um, why do we still uh, talk about humanitarian intervention instead of maybe talking about humanitarian imperialism, which is what it actually is? This kind of intervening on behalf of humanitarian intention, which are mm, actually uh, motivated by geopolitical um, reasons? I mean, I think it's, it's clearly possible to achieve goods without intending to achieve them. So if we take, for example, the Crime Watch example where I, I phone the hotline and my intention is to get the money, the reward. I don't intend to save these, these future potential victims of this murderer. They really play no, their, their suffering plays no role in my deliberation at all about what to do. Um, but nonetheless, in virtue of the fact that I phone the hotline, I secure the good. Um, so it's clearly possible um, to secure goods that you don't intend to secure. Um, so long as you're acting in ways in which um, your actions are reasonably likely to secure these goods, um, as in when I phone the hotline and it's pretty likely, therefore, they're going to apprehend the villain, um, it seems to me that when I'm, when I'm acting in a way that's going to avert great suffering, mm. that can be permissible if it turns out, even if averting the suffering is kind of a side effect of what I'm really trying to pursue. So, I mean, I don't think that... Um, I mean, I agree it's better if you intervene out of the right motivations. But the question is, is it impermissible to intervene with the wrong motivation even when you'll still secure the good? And my answer to that question is no, it's not. Yes. Um, two points. Uh, I, I find it very difficult to think that intention can be completely uh, ruled out of any decision making. In law, for example, uh, mens rea, the intention of your act, is um, absolutely central to, for example, whether you commit murder or whether you commit manslaughter. In the, the real world of decision making, going back to Libya, for example, the Security Council had to come to a decision about um, the mandate that it gave in, in, uh, in uh, Security Council Resolution 1973. And the sticking point was the, uh, the use of the phrase, by all necessary measures. Now, I have spoken to the, um, the Foreign Office official who was instrumental in making sure that that phrase went into that, um, into that resolution. Because he said that they, they knew, the Allies, you know, the, the Western Allies knew that once that was in, as mission creep uh, took over, they could, in fact, get rid of Gaddafi. Right? So you could say that getting rid of Gaddafi was a good for the Libyan people. But the unintended consequence 
was that it completely ruined the relationship with the Russians and the, the Chinese, which meant that they couldn't get any kind of um, uh, agreement on Syria. So the intention of the, um, of the people who wanted to put that phrase into that resolution actually then became the cause for something that they didn't want to happen later on. So intention has to be taken into account. And it's not their intention, right? It's the fact that they put the clause in, irrespective of what they intended. It's the presence of the clause which made the difference, not what those, not, not what those drafting it intended. But they intended to bring down Gaddafi if they could. Whereas the clause was about the protection of civilians in Benghazi and you know, in, within Libya as a whole. And the Russians and the Chinese thought that they had been fooled by their agreement. They said that they had agreed to something which was then um, taken advantage of as the, as the conflict unfolded. Um, I mean, I might need to know more about the details of that case. Um, can, can I say something about what you said at the beginning about the, um, the law? Um, because I think, so you, you may draw this analogy, you say, look, the intention is pivotal um, for whether, say, something counts as murder or manslaughter. This is true, and remember, I'm not saying intention is always irrelevant, but in that case, for example, intention is relevant to what, to what you have done. It doesn't seem to me relevant to permissibility. I don't think the claim is something like, look, if you didn't intend to kill him, then it was okay. Right? So it, it's, in that case, intention is relevant to what you've done, and I agree, your intention can be relevant to how we classify actions in that sense. Right? It can make the difference between whether something is murder or manslaughter. I don't think anybody thinks that as long as you, it was unintentional, it was permissible. So it doesn't even get a, get a grip on the permissibility, which is what I'm talking about. Um, but the, uh, the other case is interesting, so I'll think more about that. Thank you. Uh, there was one more question. Uh, can you handle another question? Oh, I should think so. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Mine is uh, a very short one. Um, I want to start from um, the scenario that developed after the situation in Syria. Um, I'll look at uh, close at home here in the UK. Uh, we understand or we heard that the Prime Minister advanced the motion to intervene, but it was shut down. We also heard uh, the voice of Obama, where he was talking about uh, at a certain point of a red, a red line having been crossed. Um, we also heard about a scenario in the UN Security Council where there were actually resolutions that were being made to um, effect a possible humanitarian intervention. All those, I think, were shot down. And there was a point that people were thinking anything was going to happen. And I want to borrow your language using the we, which I think you defended, and I want to proceed from there. Where are we on the issue of Syria? Because it looks there have been other developments which are not really um, in tandem with um, uh, the, the forces of good in terms of peace. I think I want to rest my case there. Thank you. I'm sorry, could you just clarify the question quickly, sorry. <laughs> I'm saying, where are we? Because there are developments in Syria which I think are not in tandem with uh, forces of peace. And uh, as I have said, I'm trying to borrow... Are you, are you asking whether we're responsible for those things in yes, virtue of our failure I'm, to intervene? I'm, yes, right, in terms okay. of intervention, where are we? Um, I mean, I think to answer that question, we'd have to know whether or not it was right to refuse to intervene in Syria. And I think that that's probably true, um, that it was right to refuse Cameron's plan, certainly, which just seemed all over the place, right? It was really unclear what Cameron was proposing we do. It looked like some kind of punitive measure. Um, just war theory generally is not in favour of punitive war at all. So um, I think given the choice that Parliament was given, right, this is the plan of action proposed. Um, it was right to refuse to, to sanction this plan. Um, whether Cameron should have proposed a different plan, a better plan, and whether that would have been successful and therefore um, he's responsible for that failure and that in virtue of the fact that we could have 
um, improve the situation and we fail to do so. It could be that we, um, Cameron at least bears responsibility for that failure and for subsequent harms that have occurred. Um, but I don't know enough about the details of what um, could have been successful in Syria. As I say, I, I, I'm quite careful as a philosopher not to try and lay claims to expertise about things that philosophers don't have expertise about. And whether or not we ought to have intervened in, in Syria depends on facts on the ground that philosophers and most of us actually probably don't have access to. Um, so that's just a, a, an open question at the moment for me about whether or not we ought to have intervened. If it's true that we should have, and Cameron should have had a better plan that he should have put to Parliament and we should have endorsed, um, then it, yes, it could be true that Cameron bears responsibility for subsequent wrongs. Yes. Well, I think we'll bring it to a close now. Um, the number of questions and the lively debate, I think, uh, justifies me in saying that your intervention here this <laughs> afternoon was justified. <laughs> and <laughs> Nice. And please join me in thanking Helen for her address. Thank you very much.